All right, here we are, the inaugural episode of Territory Marks. Very excited to go down memory lane where my co-host and I talk about our favorite memories and matches from the 80s, sometimes 90s, maybe sometimes late 70s. Uh, <laughs> but that pretty much taps out at 90, I'd say 92. Uh, it's me, Zach Schaefer. I'm one half of the team. Dustin's not here. This is a $2 late fee show, but Dustin knows zero about wrestling. So perhaps he'll come on on a later episode and we can talk about it. Not zero. He said he knows from his action figure LJN days. He remembers some of the figures that he had and he can maybe go there. But um, now joining me is, well, a, a man that I have the utmost respect for. A uh, very limited amount of time in knowing him, but huge fan of his career and what he's done inside the ring, on the screen, as an actor and a professional wrestler, Paul London. Paul, what's going on? Zach, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Uh, you know, even though, like you said, short-lived knowing each other, I can already tell you're my favorite tag team partner. Oh, wow. So, yeah, this is just the chemistry, the things we have in common, the, you know, you even just mentioning about being a fan of early 80s and uh, 80s, uh, a bit exploitative horror films, but just the underground stuff. And that's right up my alley. So love that. And uh, so when you presented this idea about doing territory marks, I started to salivate because I'm not a fan of current day wrestling. So <laughs> what better thing to do than go down memory lane? Yeah, thank, nor God YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> thank God for YouTube. Yeah. And thank God for certain things that the WWE hasn't locked down yet. So right. Um, right. fortunately, yeah, I, I really quickly, uh, my backstory is I grew up watching wrestling started out in the mid 80s actually early 80s uh, i think my introduction was watching big time wrestling in uh, detroit my mom's pe teacher was george the animal steel no and, way yeah no joke wow uh, listening to uh dick the bruiser on the local radio rock rock station the riff uh talking about his days in wrestling way back when that's kind of how I got hooked into it. And the rest is history. You know, I, I, I love, uh, and the onset of this, we talked about in the intro, uh, we mentioned territories and, and the territories in the eighties were a lot of different places all over the country before WWE basically became the Amazon or the Walmart of the business and, uh, owning everything. And there were all these little smaller territories like world-class championship wrestling and, the CWA and the AWA and the NWA and Florida championship. And uh, I thought, you know what? Well, to be a mark. And if you don't know what that is, it's but what, what, well, Paul, what is a mark? A mark, you know, it's funny that term originates from the carnival days from what I've gathered. And basically the carnival barker, as he would allow patrons to come through and get their ticket to go into the carnival would keep some chalk or baby powder in his pocket so he would put his hand in there and kind of get some powder on his hand and he'd be like oh right this way sir right this way and you pat them on the back and it would mark them okay so that's how the rest of the people in the carnival knew oh there's a mark right he wouldn't do that to everybody but like the people that were like very excited just very you know ready to just willing to believe everything and just overexcited, right? So yeah. it's since kind of changed uh, over the years. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's kind of like the ultimate fan, you know, the fan that'll be there through through good times, bad times, good matches, terrible matches. You're a fan, <laughs> you know, and we're yeah. all marks um, for one thing or another. Some people, unfortunately, are marks for themselves. Uh, but this we don't true. have those people here. They're no. out of here. We threw them out of the territory. <laughs> they went onward. We moved them out. They went on to the Carolinas. <laughs> so we sandpapered yeah. their foreheads in the back and uh, sent them running. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, we put uh, Crisco corn oil in their windstraw. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the you know, I am admittedly a mark because. I love professional wrestling. Um, I really kind of fell in love with it. Funny enough, through the magazines, uh, 
mm, before yeah. I started seeing it on TV. So my young 11 year old brain started to try and put things together and make sense of still images. And it wasn't until I started really watching it. Of course, my first real exposure was WWF and uh, NWA, WCW. Mm -hmm. But growing up in Texas, we had some of the best territories. You know, we had Southwest Championship Wrestling. We had obviously World Class Championship Wrestling. Um, so, and, and my father, he went to school at what I believe is now West Texas A and M something. But he, okay. some of his classmates were uh, like um, the DiBiases, because uh, like it was Ted DiBiase, Iron Mike DiBiase, his father. Uh, I believe Tito Santana went to this college. There were a lot of wrestlers that went through this college. Um, but it wasn't something that my father and I sat down to watch wrestling with. If anything, mm. they were more so worried that I would you know, get the bug. But fast forward, my first real trainer uh, was the Polish power, Ivan Putsky. Wow. He really broke me into the wrestling business. Um, yeah, at first I tried to get training from exotic Adrian Street, but he just ripped me off. And uh, yeah, yeah would have been total, wild. total carny move, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but then I was fortunate enough to get trained by Dory Funk Jr. and Terry Funk. So, wow. you know, I take a lot of pride in feeling uh, as though I'm a bit of a crossover from territory type training, you know, that style of really weeding guys out and seeing if they're worthy of being in the ring. Um, because back then, you know, it, it was very clickish, yeah. very closed doors, and kayfabe was alive and well. And for a lot of people who don't know what kayfabe is, kayfabe is another kind of carnival term, but it's basically what you'll say out into the locker room whenever there are marks present, meaning fans, people who aren't part of the show. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a bit of a um, keyword to protect the business. Yeah, you know, so if a, a heel and a face are talking about last night's shenanigans, and uh, you know, you say kayfabe, you know, they'll separate immediately and whatever, just to try and protect the business. Wow. So, yeah, it's something that I, I'm still a proponent of. I believe in kayfabe, and it it takes a real commitment. But sadly, it's something that a lot of people uh, feel is dead. I feel it's up to the performer. But if the people bought tickets, then they're there to believe something. And it's, you know, your job to make them believe. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, $2 late fee celebrates nostalgia from the 80s. And this is territory marks as a continuation of celebrating nostalgia from the 80s in the squared circle. You know, and Absolutely. we we are we are going to talk about each episode. We're going to talk about one match each. We each bring an episode we we each bring a match to the episode to talk about uh sprinkling in some pop culture moments at the end from that time just like we do on two dollar late fee so there's a little bit of a continuation there um and paul and i are we we ahead of time we have to watch the matches obviously so we know what we're talking about but getting to the first episode and figuring out which matches to kind of start with was a big deal. Because if you want, if you go into the first match with something that's going to just flame out in 30 seconds, you know, what the hell are you listening to this podcast for? You want something to going to bring fire, right? Yeah. So uh, it was a tough decision for both of us. In fact, after I chose my first match, I went back and forth. I'm like, should I have picked a different match? I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, uh, Mine was really quick, and and I, I I've said this before on on two dollar late fee. Um, to this day, I go to bed sleeping thinking about wrestling. When I was a kid, I was playing with my action figures, and I didn't like the old school LJ on the LJN Galoob figures uh, because they couldn't couldn't move them right. Yeah, the big kind of rubber. Uh, you know, I think they were probably this. They were, they had some good size, but yeah, no mobility. Just... They're like eight, ten to ten or eleven inches tall, right? They're huge, yeah. right? Yeah. And and then the Galoob ones that came out later on from WCW were a smaller version of that, but still didn't move. <laughs> Anyways, I had, and I think your brother, and you'll appreciate this, your brother Jonathan from Geekscape. Um, I had the Superpower DC figures, and I had the Marvel uh, Secret War figures. And those had some pretty decent articulation for back in the day. 
and I had a wrestling ring that was about the size. It was like my AWA Remco ring uh, nice. made out of cardboard, which I still own, by the way. No way. <laughs> With all the figures, too. Most of oh, them. Wow. I'll have to bust that out sometime when we get to him. Well, I actually should have. I don't have any. Well, I don't want to spoil that. Anyways, um, I use those wrestlers for my I use those toys for my wrestlers. And as I got older and stopped playing with toys, it went all into the memory bank, all into the box. And I renamed a lot of these characters to my own like wrestling character names, right? And to this day, I have storylines that date all the way back to the 80s, just continuation. Wow. And it's a variation on some of the matches that I'll talk about in this series that uh, that I loved, you know, people swerving other people, uh, sure. dealt, you know, stuff like that. So I go, my meditation to go to bed at night is thinking about wrestling. And so I kind of eat, sleep and drink it. And um, it's, a, you know, it's been always a big deal to me to want to bring it to $2 late fee. And here we are. And it's an honor to have you uh, tag team in with me. And ditto, man, I couldn't think of anybody else to fill those shoes. I was like, Paul, it's got to be me and Paul. The, the, <laughs> the worlds are aligning right now. I can feel it, yeah. brother. You so, can use my boots. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, mine, by the way, are cowboy wrestling boots. Then I should have worn those in the, for the occasion. Maybe I am. This is for the everyone listening. Maybe we're wearing those wrestling boots with the cowboy. We have our bleach jeans tucked into the cowboy boots with no belt. Right. And fanny packs. With those um, fanny packs. Oh my God. Right. So we keep our gimmicks. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> so are you ready to get into this? Are you ready to talk about these matches? And I, and real quick, I think what else is so wonderful about what you presented here with territory marks is that you know some of these matches might be familiar to the to the viewer and the listener, but fortunately we'll find some matches in hopes that you can then look up yourself and really start opening up uh, that own kind of, it is Pandora's box because you will become re-addicted to genuine, real professional wrestling. And uh, yep. I guess there is a warning here that if you're watching current wrestling on television, you might not be as excited about that stuff after watching some of these matches. So this is the yeah. real deal. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think uh, for, for those that are listening that are not wrestling fans, but love the show anyways, we might make you we might make you a fan. You might be a mark by the by the time uh, this episode ends or the, the future ones do. And if you're watching this, you already are. Mark. Yeah, that's right, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going in chronological order. We're talking about two matches tonight, both from the 80s. And uh, Paul's going to start us off with his match. Paul, what is the match that you brought to, tonight, to tonight's episode? Well, similar to you, I was going back and forth over countless matches. It was kind of, you know, the mindset of it has to be something so epic. And, you know, and there's so many to choose from because, you know, this was life. This was life. These were wrestlers true wrestlers these were people that you didn't want to meet outside in a dark alley these were people that you believed these were people that looked the part they lived the part they were the part they dragged their families uh you know their wives their children their mistresses they dragged them across the country depending on what territory was having them come in to, yeah. to start a program you know, maybe there was a need for a baby face in San Francisco or they needed a hot heel down in San Antonio. And you could pretty much just pick up and, and take off on a note's notice. Um, there's a story going back to when Tully Blanchard used to work for his father, Joe Blanchard, I believe in San Antonio. And Tully got into a bar fight and kind of got whooped. And his father was so embarrassed, he shipped him right out of the territory. He's like, what can I do with you now? Like, so you're out of here. You're going to the Carolinas. You wow. leave like tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because so, he pretty much jobbed out at the bar, right? Yeah. And like, you know, word was going to travel. So it was mm -hmm. like, that's how serious kayfabe is. So wow. uh, I thought a lot about this and it literally a good friend of mine as well, uh, kind of just helped calm me down. He's one of my wrestling encyclopedias, but he said, you know what? 
just just go with what you dig. And what I dig is tag it's team wrestling. wrestling. That's how uh, I made a lot of my living in the ring was a tag team specialist. And when I think of the career that I had in tag team wrestling, a tag team that was very influential to myself uh, and my a few of my partners uh, were the Rockers. Mm. But before they were the Rockers in the WWF, they were the Midnight Rockers in the AWA. And one of their biggest feuds was with the Playboy, Buddy Rose, and the Pretty Boy, Doug Summers. Um, no so, relation, no relation to Doug Summers from uh, American Flyers. Yeah, yeah, or Mark Summers from sorry, Mark Nick Summers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so these these teams had a a series of matches, and Doug Summers and Buddy Rose, uh, they had just won the tag team championships from Scott Hall, who would later on be known as Razor Ramon, and Kurt Hennig, who would later go on to be Mr. Perfect. And this was before Vince McMahon kind of poached the different territories of who he wanted. And that's kind of what led to the end of the territories, yeah. sadly, was uh, Vince McMahon doing just that. He poached the territories, all their greatest talents, and put them on TV repackaged as something that he thought was marketable. A lot of those went on to great success, and some of them didn't. So this this feud between Doug Summers, Playboy Buddy Rose, and the Midnight Rockers, who were a very young Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, uh, I feel that this is really what helped elevate Shawn and Marty to put them in the kind of in the scope where they were noticed by WWF. Apparently, it was Pat Patterson that took note of them. It was like, we really need to sign these guys. Okay. But had they not gone through this feud with Doug Summers and Buddy Rose, I don't know that that would have happened because this truly elevated them to, to real players, real players in the business, especially for being in their early 20s. So the match that I selected was one that it actually occurred on August 30th, 1986, but it aired on September 2nd, so just a few days later, and this okay. is back on ESPN, when ESPN had professional wrestling. Wow. And now they have bowling and darts. <laughs> Bring back the real pro wrestling. <laughs> Seriously. So, yeah, and this was from the Showboat Casino in Las Vegas, um, which, as far as I could tell from what I noticed, uh, that was kind of closed in January of 2004, sadly, but it mm. was a match for some of the biggest matches around. AWA, I believe, had a contract with it, and they had some of their big, big shows at the Showboat Casino, and it just creates a great atmosphere. So yeah. as I was thinking about it and thinking of a match to select, it seemed like the perfect choice. This is a tag team match that is brilliant like in so many ways. You have the pompous, cocky heels who are veterans, just wily veterans. Like I said, they had just won the tag belts. Uh, I believe back in May of 86 okay. from extremely accomplished Scott Hall and Kurt Hennig. Um, Two so beefy the guys, by the way. Two beefy guys. Right. Yeah, big beefy guys. And, you know, AWA was mainly running a lot of like the Minnesota area, but they were running, you know, Midwest. Uh, so for them to come and do these shows in Vegas, it was it was kind of like a pretty big deal. You know, it was like where they would have a blow off um, who they would have at ringside as their lovely and dastardly valet was Sherry Martel. Um, and what's funny to note wow. about a lot of this is that, you know, some six, seven, eight years later, Shawn Michaels would adopt Sherry Martel as his valet when he went heel as the sexy boy Shawn Michaels and turned on Marty Jannetty much later in WWF. So it's kind of neat to see where a lot of these seeds were were kind of put out there, you know, early on and to think that, you know, this uh, this established a lot of things that later would grow on to something else, you know, and yeah. 10 years after this match, Shawn Michaels would be WWF champion. So um if you're a fan of Shawn Michaels, if you're a fan of Marty Jannetty, if you're a fan of real tag team wrestling, and you're if you're a fan of just gritty, just down and dirty heels who aren't 
concerned with being cool or doing the cool moves, um, this is the match for you. I mean, this match, as I mentioned, it's it's perfect psychology of your heels and your faces. Literally five minutes into this match, Shawn Michaels gets dumped to the apron. And as Buddy Rose draws the referee's attention, Doug Summers uh, goes and grabs Shawn and drags him across the apron and rams his head into the turnbuckle uh, bindings, which is like a metal kind of, that's how they used to tur- uh, tighten the ropes back then. It's like a, uh, yeah, it's like a, like a turnbuckle. Yeah. I know because I've busted my own head up on these before. Oh. But it turns into a bloodbath. You know, yeah. this match is an absolute bloodbath. So five minutes into what was about an 18-minute match, uh, I believe three of these guys all get busted open throughout the course of this match. Both right. Sean, Marty, and Doug Summers are uh, showing some real color here. Real color. And traditionally, the baby face would draw color to really garner more sympathy. So the thing that I truly love about this match so much is the selling, the selling here, because that's ultimately what's going to make these people believe. And the, the, the house is so raucous. Like they're just so into everything, everything, every movement, every, um, raising the fist to show that there's still fight every wild swing. I mean, just everything, even just the kickouts to show that they're still alive. There was very much just tons and tons of heat on Buddy Rose and Doug Summers. Big time. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a work of art. It's a work of art. Um, And funny enough, the match ends in a DQ, you know. Um, So it's not like there was a a definitive kind of, uh, oh, we're going to see the big title switch. Um, But it was just so much of just the fight of the baby faces. And there's a double heat here. Which, for those who don't know, heat is when the heel is really taking a beating and putting a beating on the baby face. He's done something dastardly behind the ref's back. Uh, ideally, cheating. You never really kind of wanted the the heel to outsmart the baby face because then the baby face would kind of look like a doofus. Yeah. Um, so genuinely, you know, the baby face would come out firing, come out firing, full of house, you know, just full of fire, and it would get the the heel on it, you know, on his heels, so to speak. Yeah. So having tag team wrestling really afforded so many other avenues for there to be stuff done behind the referee's back. And so, like I mentioned, you know, five minutes into the match, uh, Sean gets busted open uh, and it's a beautiful color job. You don't see the blade. You don't see any of that. Um, But he's just, he's just, a crimson mask yeah a crimson mask and he's just showing that fight he is showing that fight actually early on right before he gets busted open you see the the very early shades of the super kick because you he do. throws they they would call it a crescent kick mm-hmm. or a martial arts kick because they didn't you know the super kick hadn't been invented yep um but you couldn't ask for better foils than Buddy Rose and Doug Summers because they sold their asses off too. And they knew when to put the right amount of heat on there, when to change gears, when to ramp it up, uh, when to throw them to the outside and draw the, the referee so that Sherry or the other partner could could do stuff uh, behind the ref's back and throw them back in and do the like, I didn't touch them, you know? Right. like So... Uh, and then, you know, Sean eventually makes the tag to Marty, who's just gangbusters. He's just going wild, full yeah. of fire. And he's just unloading, and then he's unloading, and he's taking them both out. But then eventually he even gets busted open, and now he's a crimson mask. And now they're putting the heat on Marty, and it's like, oh, my God, they're never going to make it. There's no way. There's no way. Um, you know, so it's funny because – Buddy Rose was the only one who didn't uh, color in this match. He didn't get busted open, but it's just beautiful. I love this match so much. And it's just, it's a real work of art. And it's like tag team wrestling in the most, uh, I mean, these guys are all maestros of what they're doing. And to think of Sean and Marty in their early twenties, it's amazing. It's really amazing. You know, 
and these aren't bodybuilders, you know, like no. Doug Summers, they called him the, uh, well, he was the, the pretty boy, but you look at Buddy Rose and they would call him the dough boy. Yeah. You know? Um, but just, just great, great heels. And, you know, it takes great faces to make great heels and it takes great heels to make great faces. Totally. So I feel that this is the match that truly elevated the midnight rockers to just another level. Um, and it's funny because later on, once, you know, it breaks down and it's DQ'd, there's a moment where I want to say it's at the 20-minute mark after the, uh, the locker room's emptied and the baby, some different baby faces have run out Rick there. Ganya, to try. yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I had to get yeah, his boy. camera. <laughs> Absolutely. But if you look at the 20-minute mark, there's blood drops on the camera. Oh, so there's a bit of blood Whoa. on the camera lens. Jeez. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. And uh I didn't notice yeah. that. Wow. Yeah, it's there's a big glob of blood right on the camera lens at Whoa. At the mark. <laughs> so, That's wild. Yeah. Well, I, I will say too, okay, so I mean I have a lot I'm, I'm like chomping at the bit here because uh I, I'd never seen this match before. I remember the the uh the rivalry these two teams had back in the day, I believe on the Shawn Michaels um, story, the WWE disc that they put out years ago, they, they touched on this a little bit, like the birth of the midnight rockers who, by the way, came out to the theme of uh, living after midnight by, oh, yeah. by Judas priest. And we will talk about the music later, but um, it's a great theme. And in, in buddy and summers, you know, that was a different era, right? Where the dudes like looked like nothing but they could beat the holy hell out of you yeah. and it reminded me a little bit like you know wildfire tommy rich that guy shouldn't by today's standards should never been an nwa champion but he was at one point which is pretty wild right. um these guys there's no way in hell these guys nowadays would have been world tag team champions you know by today's standards probably, probably not but my god they sold it left and right they were such great heels the midnight rockers i mean i'm, I'm a, unabashedly a huge genetti fan and same here i mean he and and honestly i think he could he was a better talker before sean but that's a whole other story um and <laughs> and those two like sean is in the ring it's a it's like you said it's an 18 minute match but sean's in the ring for 12 minutes the first 12 minutes of the match i tracked it i'm like when's he gonna make a tag because this is insane Martin hadn't been in the ring yet no <laughs> And then when At he gets all. in, it's like two minutes in and he's bloody, you know, and yeah. um, and it's what a story. And and like you said, to see Sherry pop up out of nowhere, like I forgot that she managed those guys and yeah. she was around this business so, for such a long time. And what a iconic female presence in the ring and Absolutely. outside the ring uh, and a talker to everything. But this this moment, this capsule reminded me of, of the AWA had such a unique look, right? Definitely. They, uh, the, even the way, the positioning of the camera, the main, like the, the, what, I don't know what you call it. Like, but the main, the hard, the hard cam. Yeah, yeah. The hard cam. Yeah. Um, the typically when I, by nowadays, I, 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 the, the one, one guy is on like the left side and one guy's on the right. Well, these are like facing the cam one guy's facing the camera. The other guy, the other teammate is, is like his back is to the camera. Right. It's just an interesting perspective. And I kind of liked it to be honest with you. Like, this is cool to see the action from a different point of view. Definitely lends itself to it appearing as a legitimate sport, you know, which is probably why yeah. ESPN aired it and had it, you know, as one of their regular programs. Um, but also the commentating, I think just oh, really yeah. lends itself to it being legitimate in a sport you know and 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 it was just it's such a wonderful thing to to witness um and you really see the fire uh behind the baby faces not giving up and digging deep and they're throwing wild punches because they're both just bleeding and you know even when doug summers gets busted open in the, in the turnbuckle as well he gets uh thrown into that turnbuckle twice i oh, believe it's dramatic that Yep. And he falls back and his blade job maybe wasn't as uh, secretive as Sean's. No. Uh, but Sean had the, the the luxury of kind of putting his head under the ring skirt outside yep. 
and yep. doing it. Um, nowadays, you'll just see the guys, you know what I mean? And it's, it's embarrassing um, yeah. because, you know, you would think you getting your head busted on a piece of metal, it's going to gash you open. Yeah, because it's exposed like that. That turnbuckle is padded, but right behind it, like you were describing, that kind of metal bracket that binds the, the ropes together, that's totally right. unexposed. And so the fact that Sean gets his head cracked hard on that thing. So yeah. legit, I believed it, you know, uh, hook, line and sinker. And he's out of the ring long enough for him to do what he needs to do out there. So by the time he gets back in, it, it just it feels so authentic and and dramatic, and he sells like nobody, you know, as such a yeah. young kid. Um, Absolutely, and I love that Marty fun. jumps down and runs around to check on him, even yeah. though he's in bad guy territory. You know, it's like right at the heels corner, but he's kind of just like God, you know what I mean? Like I need to check on him, like he's you know, and and that just really just shows that unification of of, of a real tag team. You know, like... and also too, uh, you know, I showed this match to my son and my son is eight and he watches oh, wow. a lot of wrestling. I, he, I was watching wrestling with him when he was, when, uh, when he was a little baby, we were watching a war games match and I'm like, you're not going to oh, remember this, but such a I, great day. his first, uh, his first Halloween costume was, that he chose was sting, uh, surfer sting. Yeah. So anyways, oh, it. yeah, it's so great. It's so great. But, yeah. um, Did I watched this match with him. And and again, there's there's you're not seeing the move set that you see nowadays, but he was like, oh, oh, like reacting to every punch, every kick. Um, and and he's like, wow, this is intense. I go, yeah, this this feels like a real fight. Like these guys, I said, bud, it's kayfabe. They don't they probably do get along, but these guys hate each other in the ring. Like they are just tearing it up. And right. yeah, Marty what a, like the midnight rockers were such a unique team I mean, we had other teams that rock and roll express for example that uh another team i love but these guys were young like mid, the rock and roll express looked like they were in their 30s because they were in their 30s these guys looked like they were in their 20s and they looked like little kids and, and it, it was so much relate mo, so much more relatable uh you look in that audience and you talked about the audience was on fire that's a make or break situation too. Like if the audience is dead, it takes right. the energy out of the match and they were so into it and right Absolutely. next to it too. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're going crazy, crazy. And there's a lot of young and a lot of old in that crowd. And I don't think Doug Summers and Buddy Rose had too many fans and that's how they would want it. You know what I mean? Those were heels that loved and relished being hated because that's what drew money. Because when yeah. it came time for you to get your ass whipped, like that was going to draw money. And that's what they were paying tickets to see, to see you eventually get your comeuppance. So in a match like this, where sure, ideally you would think, oh my God, like they fought through just blood and agony and pain and everything. And they finally won the tag belts. Like, nope. They're going to have to wait. Yep. Like we're going to draw that out. Uh, you know, so the booking's brilliant, you know, in my opinion, because you're giving the the fans right on the edge of, oh, are they going to win? Are they going to win? They haven't given up. They haven't given up. And then it's like, oh, DQ. Like, oh, no. God, you know, and always have the fans uh, go home craving more. How are you they going to beat mean? these guys? Like, how are they going to do this? And they, yeah. you know, it, yeah. it, it makes you want to buy the ticket for the next show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's funny thinking about that turnbuckle uh, being exposed. I remember one of my first cruiserweight title defenses took place in San Diego at the uh, San Diego sports ring, I believe. Um and I had gotten pulled into the turnbuckle by my trunks as I was starting to fight back. This was against an ex-partner, Billy Kidman. And there was a bolt exposed behind the turnbuckle padding. And my head went right into it. Ooh. And it just started gushing bad. And I yeah. ended up getting 22 staples in my head. Wow. But you could sense the the atmosphere of the match. You could sense the the intensity elevate because i was covered in blood and they kept asking me if i wanted to stop but i there was no way i was gonna stop you know what i mean right 
fighting and we ended up getting uh getting through it and i ended up rolling him up for the pin and it just it's one of the better moments i've had in my career where i felt that you know and this was all by accident getting busted open yeah. it's called hard way as we say when you get busted open legit um and it really the audience responded in a way that i hadn't had before and and then i ended up getting jumped afterwards uh by two heels and there was just there was a ton of heat it was one of my favorite memories so when i think of watching this match in particular and just seeing that fight i mean that's i was just breathing that and and it wasn't anything to the level of what these guys did because to me this was just a master class in tag team wrestling uh with heels and baby faces and just the selling that's what i just love so much though is just the selling you know yeah. and it's funny because you say when you when your son was watching it and it wasn't all these crazy moves that you see today but they were they were it was legitimate moves it was stuff that you could see done in a bar fight that makes sense oh, yeah. yep and it's done as legit as possible and it's believable it's believable yep. It's absolutely believable. And again, that's one of the things I loved about the heels. They weren't trying to be cool by doing, you know, this and that and innovation and all this kind of nonsense. They were just mean. They just wanted to beat you down and beat you at any, you know, opportunists. That's what the original, you would call a heel an opportunist because it's like, there's a way to take advantage. They'll do it, you know, by hook or by crook. So just a beautiful match. I absolutely love it. And uh, who knows, we might cover a couple more of the matches in this feud. I hope so. I hope so, because I really dig seeing, especially Buddy Landell, who um, I was introduced. Buddy, Buddy Landell would come later. But yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, Doug he Summers. Was, he, he was kind of job, He, you know, Buddy Landell would, I, I only remember him kind of as a jobber in, in uh, the later days of NWA, early days of WCW seen him yeah. pop up and, and not knowing who he was and then i think on that documentary the ww uh maybe f documentary back at the time it, like they put out some they paid a nice tribute to those guys and you know, sean even you know put him over he was like no they they really helped us kind of get our start and the, it's beautiful it's beautiful really beautiful yeah no, i love it so Great 19 match. and i'm and i'm glad by the way i'm glad you're still alive after 22 staples in the back of your head and <laughs> That was nothing. That was nothing. Yeah, I, I can imagine. You know, they're like, do you want to cut a promo? Let's clean you up for a second. No, you're not cleaning me up. We're doing the promo like this. Bro. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. So Hard way, baby. Come on. That's right, man. As real as it gets. That's right. I still feel it. it feels oh, like a set of loops on my wow. head. Wow. Jeez. <laughs> so, so what, Um, are there some fun nostalgic facts you pulled from 1986? September of 1986. I mean, I was uh, I was six years old at this time, and so I was trying to think back. I and mean, there were so many great films that came out. Obviously, we were in kind of like the Reagan era yes. at this point. But um, The Fly was leading the box office that had topped the box office, um, which is still to this day a very tough film to watch. I mean, it's body horror. Uh, personified i mean yeah. it's really fantastic film and still to this day one of jeff goldblum's standout performances as well as gina davis uh but i would think that this is um one of cronenberg's you know babies and it's it's absolutely fantastic so great film wasn't really surprised cool. to see that at the box office um although you know people love horror um, i saw that opening i saw that opening weekend with my mom with a double feature of that and aliens wow. So. Oh wow! And I mean, absolutely another another classic. One of my absolute favorites. Absolutely yep. love it. Um, which is just oh man. Did you know that uh, James Remar was Hicks originally? Yeah, yep. you, you saw it right. I Crazy. saw the photos. It's wild. Yeah, James Remar, oh. Ajax from the Warriors. You guys know how much we love him. Yeah, Hicks. And just the different stories about what went on behind the scenes there. It's kind of crazy. Um, so. Yeah, apparently there was an accident with one of the guns, and he blew a hole through one of the uh, the set next door at yeah. uh, Pinewood. I think it was like blew a hole in the Little Shop of Horrors set or something. Yeah. And they're like, 
Oh, you're out of here. So in came Michael Bean. Um, but I, yeah, I love aliens, but I, I, you know, I'm not surprised. What a double bill aliens yeah. in the fly. I remember oh my, my, my mom took on, on my other podcast, podcasting after dark. We talk about the, uh, my mom taking me to a lot of horror films, probably showing me things <laughs> I maybe should have waited a few years to see, but whatever <laughs> turned me into the guy I am today. So no, uh, and, you know, I can't say that I was, I had all my whereabouts at, at six years old, you know what I mean? Because I'm just <laughs> uh, playing outside and looking for lizards and pretending I'm a ninja. And, um, but, uh, amazing. I love it. Ban- yeah. Banana Rama's Venus was the top song at this time. Oh, nice. That, that was what was leading the, uh, the charts was uh, <laughs> Venus. So, wasn't one of my go-to songs, but I do kind of remember being in the minivan with my mom and, and listening to, you know, top 40 or whatever. And yeah. Right. I mean, absolutely. Did they so, do cruel summer also? They did. Yeah. Okay. Which wasn't funny enough. It's the only song not on the karate kids soundtrack. Yeah. Even though it's in the film. So wrong. But it's not on the soundtrack. And I'm like, this is the song I want to hear the most uh that that's a running theme on our show you know we always talk about the songs that didn't wind up on the soundtrack or the soundtrack that never got released and uh, it's very frustrating yeah no it's a bummer um but it really brought me back because i started thinking about all the cartoons that i would watch at this time and Mm -hmm. you know um i was a huge gi joe guy and so you know gi joe uh he-man and the master of the universe um even gem and the holograms is a show that i would watch from hell yeah (laughs) you know what i mean i mean dare i say i like it more now than i did way back then oh yeah no i'm sure and you know i didn't see the film that was like you don't need to just just watch the reruns with uh watch the cartoon with rio and uh yeah anyways no it it was pretty neat um Funny enough, though, another one of my favorite movies before I think before I forget about it was uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 came out like a week before this match took place. Wow. So, yeah, uh, that's one that gets kind of dumped on quite a bit, but I love it. I love it. And in, in fact, um, Bill Mosley, uh, I have an autographed metal plate from Mil- Bill Mosley. It says, lick my plate, you dog dick. <laughs> and, I, and I spent fifteen dollars on a hanger that he bent into the shape of the hanger from the movie, so I have that somewhere too. My oh, son's like, cute. "What's this for?" I'm like, "Not anything bad." <laughs> it's like that's for the areas you can't reach. Yeah. <laughs> it's a back scratcher, <laughs> son. It's a back scratcher. Uh, but you know, the NES was out. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Teddy Ruxpin was out. Did you Robert's have an AG? Field. Did you have an AG bear? I don't think I, I didn't have the Teddy Rucks bin. I certainly didn't have uh, my buddy, um, which I don't think came. I think that came along just a little bit after this. Yeah, it did. Um, yeah. Until Child's Play came out. And then it was like, oh, we got to take this off the shelves. <laughs> um, but I did have Garbage Pail Kids. Um, not a good movie either. Nope. 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 <laughs> kind of scary. You know, disturbing. As a kid. Yeah. Very disturbing. Um, but the but one thing I it was taking me back and I was like, I remember I had that was um water ring toss. Do you remember that toy? It the, was, with the buttons. Yeah, and it had little it looked like little skinny fruit loops in it, and yes. you would get them hooked on and stuff. I, I used to entertain myself so much with that thing. Um <laughs> I had sounds, the basketball one. I had the basketball one with the little basketballs. Um, basketball one work too i mean they're they're just yeah. you know and you don't need technology for these games <laughs> um but you know tetris was out mario brothers was out donkey kong legend of zelda uh but also a toy that i'd forgotten about was the pogo ball oh Do you yeah remember the pogo ball? it looked yeah. like a it looked like saturn yeah you know with the ball and you'd kind of just try to pinch the ball with your feet and jump up and down on that thing to you off the it was balance. terrible at it i had zero coordination oh i think most people because it wasn't like a big platform that you're sitting on so oh. or standing on i'm saying but uh yeah it was i miss a lot of these toys i feel for the kids today that you know you walk down the aisle at target or walmart or whatever and you see the toys and it's kind of like no it's just 
they just don't have the soul of the toys that we had back then you know like, no i mean i will say the action figures look phenomenal but from where they were like talk about wrestling figures the wrestling figures now have every articulation you can think of and they make the legends that look just like the guys in the ring but but uh but the practical toys the toys you could use as a kid that could fit, get you physically fit or or a game you could play for a long period of time they don't make them like that and they don't make them like that anymore <laughs> yeah back in our day <laughs> Kids, you young whippersnappers if only you knew what you're missing out on i want to uh, i want to interrupt interject and just say because you're like oh man I, I i gotta come up with some facts from 1986 i'm like dude you're hitting it out of the park so come on yeah well thank you uh but you know uh miami vice that was one of the top shows it's still a show that i watch religiously today uh with box sets of course Same. but um, yeah. yeah that was a show that i remember watching with my dad um because that was a show that he was pretty into he wasn't one of those dads that tried to dress like crockett or anything and want to be one of those cool dads but he just enjoyed it and i didn't quite appreciate it at six years old you know on yeah. like cocaine and hookers and all i didn't understand you know and uh you know <laughs> drug runners and all this kind of stuff i didn't get it either but i love it i loved it i love it i love it and the music is so iconic you know yep. Um, I mean, they used to spend, I think, up to 10 grand per episode just on music. Yeah, and, it and it's be it's wonderful that it's out, uh, the, the box sets that are on DVD or Blu-ray or whatever have all those songs, so you don't feel like you're, you know, getting right. a tainted version of this. Right, right, like the WWE-owned stuff where they've put their generic music back over, you know, the old ECW shows or whatever. Yeah, no, I'm with you. It's, uh, keep it intact. Um but another show that I was a big fan of was MacGyver. That was a mm -hmm. big show, um, oh, yeah. you know, and I, I can still hear that theme song in my head because it's pretty iconic in its own right. Um, it. But there was just, you know, what a great time for television. You know, I wasn't quite a Golden Girls guy or mm -hmm. Murder, She Wrote. That's when I was kind of like, well, what else is on? But um, But it was just, I mean... 80s television and cinema how can you go wrong 1986 really... was a very good year for pop culture in general absolutely absolutely i mean i'm barely scratching the surface oh i know um, we could do a whole hour just on the pop culture stuff of what came out in 86 so... i know I, I held back i held back on my selections because i was like i want to make sure there, there's a lot of matches from this particular year that i probably want to talk about so uh <laughs> well, well yeah no i mean Please, if you want to, uh, if you want to take the stage, I, I, ready I'm for this? Talk about about this this classic match. Okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and and say that um, <clears throat> my match is Sting versus the Great Muda from NWA Power Hour, September of '89. I believe it aired September first. Um, I believe that was the date. So, quick backstory. And and if we don't hit the description of every territory every episode, we will. Th these territories will come up on a regular basis, so we will be talking more in depth on certain aspects of these territories. But and the wrestlers behind these matches. Um, in July of '89, Sting, who was probably the top babyface of the NWA, soon to become the 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 main babyface for many many years. Um, wrestled the great Muda at the great American bash and they wrestled to a double pin. So for those that don't know, uh, basically their shoulders were both down on the ring at the same time. And they, it was like a, a double pin, a double loss, right. <laughs> yeah. For, for the TV title, um, great Muda was the champion at the time. Sting was the challenger. So this was Sting's rematch. The title was kind of up, um, was being held up and to and this was the match to decide who was going to get the belt up until this point um stings kind of sting started connecting with rick flair rick flair was a baby face and he was feuding with terry funk this all will tie in together uh rick flair was i think a heel for for up until the point that he wrestled uh ricky steamboat earlier that year beat Ricky Steamboat for the world title. 
Terry Funk pile drove Ric Flair through a table in one of the most vicious uh, pile drivers ever. I think I've seen during that up until that point. And Flair was out of commission for a bit with a injured neck comes back battles uh, funk at the bash in a wild match. And funk had aligned himself with the great Muda uh, and, and Gary Hart, who, if you don't know who Gary Hart is, boy, oh boy, he's going to come up a lot on this show as well because he's a master. The guy's a master. Um, And so Sting came to the rescue because Sting was feuding with Muda. Kind of makes sense that the two of those guys would link up. So um, great Muda really quick is Japanese wrestler. He's in being, he's being inducted into the WWE hall of fame. uh, The weekend that this episode drops, congratulations to him because he deserves it. Um, He came to the States in the eighties wrestling under the name. uh, I think like the white ninja or the white, uh, Oh gosh, what was it? I'll edit this out, but it's because I want to get it right. You got me. I'm, yeah, the white, I'm, yeah, white ninja. What? Yeah, he awesome. was the white ninja. He came to the the states in the white as the white ninja wrestled in uh, world class for a cup of coffee, yeah. <laughs> and then wound up in um, NWA in '89 and was uh, introduced as the Great Mota M O T A Mota, <laughs> and he was the son of the Great Kabuki which is another famed wrestler. But Gary yeah. Hart was his manager, uh, and he was something to be reckoned with. You know, Sting, who uh, had been in the NWA at this point for for many, for a couple of years. Uh, prior to that, he was in the CWA and the UWF with Jim Helwig when they were the Blade Runners, I believe. And, and, and side note, there will be times when I'm pulling up facts, and there will be times when I'm just pulling from my mem- memory bank, like, Pretty much Paul did the entire time. So, (laughs) Um, so, so Sting, you know, obviously had face paint on and then the great Muda shows up, scares the hell out of people with his face paint. Uh, He had a move set that I don't think many people had seen up into that point. Sting was considered a high flyer. He would do a big splash, uh, drop kicks, stuff like that. But Muta had the moonsault, which I had never seen until he brought it into the ring handspring back flip that he would do um just crazy moves for a time when we were not accustomed to that here in the united states at least i wasn't he wrestled sting like i said to the 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 draw or the double pin and then they had this match on the nwa power hour and it was a 15 minute match um You had everything in this match. You had interference from outside. Terry Funk shows up out of nowhere, starts getting involved in the match. Gary Hart is being the, you know, uh, the the scumbag manager (laughs) interjecting and upsetting the match. You had uh, the ref getting knocked out just like you did in actually this match and Paul's match are, are very similar because you had a man heel manager. You had uh, referees getting knocked out. And you eventually, uh, this match ends in a disqualification with Sting getting the win, but he doesn't get the title. Muta wrestles two nights later and then wins, claims the uh, the world television title, which I believe he holds for, my gosh, uh, over a year until Arn Anderson defeated him for it. Who did he beat two days after this? Did it? Do you remember? Like, I I didn't was? pull that up to be honest with you. My yeah. bad. Um, no, no, no. I'm curious if it was. I wouldn't have been like, I wouldn't have been. Uh, that's that one stumps me as well. Yeah. Yeah. That may be something that we will have to put in our, um, well, we'll have to come back for that. Maybe that'll be a match worth yeah. revisiting. And what I love about this is this match was the middle of so many great storylines. You have the eventual formation of the four horsemen with sting which Four Horsemen was a heel stable, and suddenly they bring this ultra baby face. Uh, It gets really complicated in the most dramatic way. It was maybe (laughs) one of my favorite dramatic moments of NWA. Um, This match itself was back and forth nonstop. The entrance music is great. Uh, the, The... by the way, the links, we'll put links to these matches in our show notes so you guys can watch these. 
But Sting comes out to his theme music, which was like a variation on, I think, like a, a Metallica song. Um, it's just that barrel, barrel, barrel. I might play a little clip of that. <laughs> and then Muda comes out with his mystical music, which was so creepy at the time. So good. I might yeah. play a little bit of that, too. Um, and these guys tore it up for 15 minutes and they could have kept going. I mean, Muta like never looked tired and Muta would spray green spray, uh, face paint. And, and, and I don't think he was the first to ever do that, but he definitely was the first to really bring it to the United States. Uh, and the then mess. obviously Tajiri was somebody who you would do it yeah. later on and blah, blah, blah. Kabuki but did that at, as well. Kabuki, I think yeah. did that. As well. Yeah. Yeah, Kabuki did do that as well. You're right. And so, um, and then the last thing I'll say about this before I'll, I'll, I'll let you chime in is um, the, the not only was the crowd hot, but you, in my opinion, have one of the best commentating teams, Jim Ross and Jim Cornette doing the commentating. And it is Jim Cornette who will come up as a heel manager on the show. Uh, Jim Ross, to me, like his his voice, he and... Bob Cottle and Gordon Soley are like, to me, like the voices of wrestling uh, for this yeah. era. And I couldn't, I can, I watched this match three times uh, over the course of about a month because, and uh, I absolutely love it. And in fact, I have the, uh, the sting Galoob figures. Uh, awesome. <laughs> the, oh, wow. Back in the day, I have the, I have three different ones because they released a bunch of different ones. I have the sting with the blue tights. I've sting with the black tights and sting with the orange tights. Wow. I had the one in the middle. That's yeah, the one was, that I... yeah, with the title. And... Does he have and the it... rat tail? It's the rat tail. Yeah. <laughs> which is so great. So Sting, Sting, for those of you that don't know, go to our Instagram. We've got pictures of all of the participants to all these matches. But um, Sting had a wicked rat tail back in the day. I loved it. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you. I want to get your thoughts on Sting versus Muda, NWA Power Hour, September of 89. You know, I love this match. I hadn't seen it in, I can't tell you the last time I had seen it. So when you presented it, it was just, you know, and I, getting into wrestling, I was more a WWF guy than a WCW guy. Like, um, it just was more accessible and, um, you know, but I loved WCW at the same time. I had a WCW U.S. title of uh, the foam belt with the Velcro. I had a lot of these things. I had nice. that Sting figure. Um, I wanted a Mr. Perfect figure so bad that I bought the Sid Vicious figure of that line because it was blonde. He had a singlet, even though it was black. And what, either way, it looked um, like he was taking a dump. By the way, he yeah, kind of yeah. had this like horse stance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But one of the things that really um, initially kind of stands out when I'm seeing this match is, you know, Sting was just so mega over and he hadn't even reached, um, you know, he wasn't near reaching the peak of his success or his being over. But early on in the match, even right as he gives out one of his like, whatever he does, like the howl or whatever, like the place just goes crazy. Nuts. So, crazy yeah and you know i muda say what you will i mean he was just he, we had seen martial arts done from wrestlers previously you know from the orient yeah um but his looked i feel the most legit um you know because he had real size on him. you know i mean he's a yeah. big guy i've never personally met him um but you know you never saw him as kind of a, a, a weak looking guy. He was always pretty, pretty built. And I feel that the, the, the face paint that he had, it was kind of, it was pretty creepy. Like you it said, creepy. I, you know, it, it was color coordinated to his gear, but it covered his whole face. Um, you know, it, it was uh, the closest thing to a ninja without the mask on. Totally. You know? Um, and so I was really excited though early on when you see uh Terry Funk come out because I was sitting there thinking, Oh, that's just right, and he's coming out and he's tearing off the uh the poncho and he's getting all this other stuff and he's getting it all you know, he's ready to find he's just a wily Texan ready to 
to rumble um i think he came out with his branding iron too iron which i think that those old ljn toys i think his had the branding iron it did uh, right and the yep. poncho and the cowboy hat and the chaps yep um but it makes me wonder like i want muda must have met gary hart at world class even though he was there for a short time because yep. I feel like world class is where Gary Hart really cut his teeth in terms of being just this, this dastardly heel manager, you know? And so it was neat to see that they were right there. Um, I think were they the black hearts, was that the name of this little faction? Cause I know it was like the black heart, Gary Hart. But... I think so. I think that, I think so. Um, they, they brought in, they brought in uh buzz Sawyer later on, uh, when the when the horsemen needed when they needed to kind of go at the horsemen um but but i think in in like the week prior they broke um uh oh gosh dirty dick slater's arm in the match <laughs> right with the branding iron i believe and dirty dick slater who was a heel i think at this point they were trying to maybe make him into into a face um <laughs> You know, and 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 Gary Hart, Gary Hart is such a great talker, right? It's a great right. mouthpiece. And, Absolutely. And, and and he, there's a moment where the ref is down. He's quote unquote checking on the ref, and he kind of kicks the ref. It's classic yeah. heel stuff. Yeah. On the outside, or no? In the was it on the outside? He just yeah, gives it was him the a outside beat. of the ring or something. Yeah. And it's funny because Cornette even mentions at some point, you know, Gary Hart had like the towel. And he's, you know, choking, he's giving little shots, he's doing everything he can. And to the point where Cornette's even like, he's doing a little much now, a little too much here. Like, you know, let his presence be felt and that should be good. But he's he's really overdoing it here. He's risking it, you know, he's risking getting caught. And I mean, that's kind of eventually what leads to the DQ, isn't it? I yep. mean, it, yeah, he's just like, screw it. I'm coming in and uh, interfering. Um so I thought that was, I was amused by that as well, that we had both picked matches that ended in disqualification. Yeah, um, that was totally we... by happenstance. It wasn't planned. Oh, yeah, it really was. <laughs> so to see the baby face win the title. Oh no. Um, yeah. Cause I don't want to, I won't get to uh, what happens to sting down the road because to me it, it was, it was amazing and heartbreaking at the same time. Uh, what happens in about a month or so following this match, I think at the Texas shootout uh, clash of champions, but uh, sting, you know, I think he had a match in, in at Starcade of 88 with Muta perhaps, or it was either, it might've been later this year. I'm trying my memory banks foggy. We will cover that match for sure because yeah. it's a great match. And um, you know, this was the time when the, the baby face didn't always get that win didn't no. get that win and you and and that was what made it even more exciting because you were you never knew what was going to happen you never knew what kind of run in was going to i didn't expect funk to come in i mean it did right. on one hand but it was he comes so, in early though he comes yeah. in like with the first like five minutes or so hops up on that apron just wily you know and so yeah i didn't expect that either and it's one of the better versions of terry you know where he's just it's my this, favorite Texan. Yeah, the branding iron. How can you go wrong with that? The hardcore, he he was, you know, he was hardcore before ECW. Uh like he was he was bringing that edge and his rivalry with Flair up until that point when Flair was a baby face for a cup of coffee or whatever, uh was was fantastic too. You're like you kind of rooted for Flair. You're like I want to see this kind of I want to see the side of Flair. And then you yeah. get the side that we're we're all accustomed to. <laughs> We got to see the Flair as babyface thing too, though, because that's those are such short segments in his career, you know, when he would be babyface. So, you just mentioning how Sting was uh, part of that four horsemen, I was just kind of like, oh my god, like this is mind blowing. Completely, I'd yeah. forgotten all about that stuff, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think Sting ends up doing two of the Stinger splashes in this match right we didn't get a scorpion death lock from what i remember no uh, we did not we get a press slam i believe we yeah, get a press slam, press slam. but I don't, I don't think we even get the mist in this match do no. we no. no so like you know what's so great about so many of these matches is that they're not throwing everything in there because then like what do you come back with you know exactly. what i mean the fact that they could keep the fans so engaged and 
and just the intensity with the audience based on what they were doing. And again, it's because the technique was delivered so uh, just the realism behind it. You know, there was nothing that looked like it was whiffed. There was yeah. nothing that looked like it was predetermined or that they had rehearsed it. There was none of that stuff. And it's because a lot of that was oftentimes when I gather called out there on the fly. I mean, you would kind of have a rough blueprint. Yeah. But a lot of, a lot of it was kind of winging it and going on what you hear from the audience and kind of adjusting that way. Um, so it, it just makes it so much more impressive to me. And that's why I think a lot of it, does come off so real is because in many yeah. ways that's as real as it gets that's yeah. as real as it gets you know whereas if you were to flip on tv wrestling today even from the lockup every single thing you know is generally planned out which is part of why it's so stale now yeah and if so, you didn't if you didn't hit a certain move and the crowd would be you know upset by that this was the time yeah. when you didn't know what was coming right right Right, right, right. And it just made it, it again, it just makes it real. You yeah. know, the actions are real. The the selling uh, is is accurate. It's not just kind of generic, hold my back selling, um, you know. And so it, it really made me want to chomp in and start getting a lot of this early WCW uh, kind of crossing over from nwa and i'm trying to think of when nwa kind of when when that part was dropped and it was just wcw it was 91 it was it 91 wasn't. yeah i i think um you know when flair came over from wcw to wwf uh they had That's the war right. games match earlier that year he was supposed to drop the title to he he left with the title well, he took the title with him Right. And then they yeah. had Wyndham and Luger at Great American Bash. And at this point, Wyndham chopped his hair off. Blair had chopped his hair off. The era had chopped its hair off. Um, <laughs> it just had a different vibe, you know? And and I think that's why in this show, we will really focus on this 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 specific decade and then toe dip into the 90s a bit um, because there were still some highlights early on. But um you know, this was also a time when the storyline would continue for a really long time and, and, and the payoff might not come for six months, you know, it just continued and continued and they, and, and NWA specifically on T on TBS had the clash of champions, like pay-per-view with that, That's the right. free pay-per-view. That's right. Major moments in these. And, and we will cover some of those too, but uh, this match in particular was like kind of in between. You know, this it was a it's like a chapter in between a really juicy pulp novel, and um, <laughs> it sets up what's to become uh, another major feud. And I, for me, it was also unique to see Muda, this guy Muda, that I've never seen somebody like this before. You know, I'd seen the, obviously the Road Warriors, and it's seen I think Demolition was obviously around at this point, um, and, and Sting, and I think Ultimate Warrior was a about to come into the WWF or maybe he was already there at this point. Cause this was 89. Yeah. He was there. Yeah, I think it's like very early on, but, but you're getting at the face paint, are you? It's yeah. different face paint, different face paint and intimidating without doing a whole lot. He didn't say anything guys. Like he just, he just looked at you. And then Gary Hart was the one that did the talking and Gary Hart was not a weasel. He didn't look like a weasel to me. He kind of looked like, he, well, we uh, offline, we were talking about Bill Lustig. He looked like um, from Maniac, <laughs> our, our boy uh, uh, blanking on his name right now. Oh, uh, the oh, I'm uh, Joe Spinell, Joe Spinell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> looked a little like Joe Spinell to me, which creeped me out because when I saw Maniac, I was like, this guy's freaky as hell. Um, but <laughs> I want to I want to jump into a few uh, moments from September 1980. 1989 um wow. i'm gonna focus mostly on television because i there are some really fun moments that popped out to me so in september of 89 the legend of zelda animated series premiered on the super mario brothers super show awesome and i think by most people will know the legend of zelda cartoon by the uh the, the terrible links excuse me princess <laughs> 
but it was you know it was just like the video game and there were like he he uh link would hit people with his sword and you hear the coin effect go off or that but he you know when he would shoot the uh the power sword at people it was a terrible cartoon but i still loved it it was so bad but it was fun <laughs> Uh, in in September of that month, same year, TGIF premiered on ABC. Oh wow! Eighty nine. So the the original lineup was Full House, Family Matters, Perfect Strangers, and Just the Ten of Us. Wow! Did you watch all of those? Or because I'm think... trying to remember just the ten of us. I was definitely a fan of Full House and Family Matters. <laughs> I can't remember ten, just 10 of us. It was, I watched all of them. Um, I remember uh, Jamie Lunar and uh, Heather Langenkamp were some of the daughters in this. Oh, and, okay. okay. And he was a coach, but they were like a Catholic family. Oh my God. It was the re- the religious was stuff back in the day. The Killing older me. woman um, who would, she was kind of like the house mother. Yes. Um yeah, I, I believe uh, I forget the name of the the the, the mom, uh, right? Or, or like the house mom. You're right. When you said Heather Lang, I kind of rang a bell because I was like, "Oh yeah, okay, now it's starting to remember." But I was a boy, you know. It was like all oh, these girls in the show, now, I'm not... and the music was so cheesy. Bill Medley was doing it the best I can. It was just so <laughs> cheesy. Er, yeah, but I kind of like that stuff now. Back, back, back yeah. then, I was 13 or 12. I'm like, I don't, 13, yeah, I could care less about this stuff. I think I watched, um, I think I, I watched Full House and Family Matters and kind of tapped out at Perfect Strength because it was so wacky, you know, like it was yeah. so cheesy. But I kind of, I like that stuff now. But back in then, back, the, back in the day, I was like, no, come on, give me the fly of 86. Um, speaking <laughs> of movies, movies that came out in 89, I'll wrap it up with this. One of my favorite movies of all time, Black Rain, came out in 1989, September of 89. Michael Douglas, Michael Douglas Ridley Scott, Andy Garcia. If you've never seen it, go watch it. Hans Zimmer does a soundtrack. Greg Allman sings the song with Hans Zimmer doing the sound, the soundtrack for it. It's amazing. It's a great poster, too. Like that poster, I remember. Uh, yes. uh, cause they used to advertise Black Rain in black belt magazine in the martial arts magazine oh, yeah you're right and you're so right. i remember that picture of michael douglas with the glasses on the motorcycle with the leather jack and it kind of had like a black and bluish kind of hue to the whole thing and it was just like yep this guy looks badass, badass. Like, this is badass. yeah uh, ken takakura uh i think is the is like the detective in that the japanese detective um kate capshaw's in it oh wow Great movie. Great movie. We may need to cover that movie down the road. I was about to say, Black Rain. It's a sleeper hit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so that is uh, two matches. That is Territory Marks in a nutshell. Yeah. Wow. I, I want to go back to the 80s. I really do. Well, we <laughs> well then that's the hook to keep you on for the show and have you do more episodes with me. <laughs> Watch me bust out an early nineties one next. <laughs> well, I got to be honest. You, you brought up Scott Hall and before he was, uh, before he was razor. And then when he joined the NWO, Scott Hall in the eighties and early nineties, he may come up. Cowboy Scott Hall. Yes. Cowboy yeah. Scott Hall with the big handlebar mustache. Yeah. I loved it, dude. Yeah. So for I, all you not go ahead. go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, it's just, you know, this whole era was just littered with guys who, you know, like we had mentioned earlier, look, they, they were men, like they were real men. They weren't all bodybuilders. They had the hairy chest, you know, a lot of them uh, in the case of like the buddy Rose, like some were pretty portly. Yeah. But you could talk all the shit you want from the audience. You see these guys outside the building, like you're not saying a word. Nope. You don't know a word because these guys are legit. And a lot of them came from shooter backgrounds where they could mess you up. Not totally Blanchard, 
but they could mess you up, you know? So, <laughs> or um, they could be your PE coach, like uh, Greg, uh, George, the animal steel. Still just baffles me. Wow. Yeah. I'll have to talk to my mom about that. He was my, my mom and my dad's PE coach, but Oh, well, a quick thing. Cause I goofed on the name. I called him uh, Greg steel and then changed it to George. Did you notice the commentator in the, uh, in the, in the midnight rockers Landell summers match call, uh, called summers uh george summers i think he oh he getting, might have he's getting flustered he was just like there's so much going on in the ring right now and oh yeah and you can imagine how hot that arena was like just temperature wise you know with like the sweat of these four four uh athletes really i mean the way they looked notwithstanding like they were still athletes they still went like you said 18 minutes yep and Oh, um, yeah. And, and you didn't have, you didn't have someone piping in commentary into the commentaries on the commentators ears, you know, what right. to say. So they, these right. guys are calling it like they see it and it, oh man, it is just pure magic, pure magic. So yeah. uh, it was great to hear Cornette as well, though, too. I mean, say what you will about him. Yeah. Uh, I'm always a fan of, of his mind. I'm always a fan of his opinions and, you know, people may not be a big fan of his current, uh, viewpoints but but i i get i learn something every time i listen to him because he's just a real encyclopedia i mean the guy's been there done that and so what better person to have on commentary you know what i mean like he just right. has that boy too um so you know and uh obviously you know jim ross before he got uh before he became a caricature right uh you know so um yeah no this is a uh, this has been a lot of fun, like just getting to see, I want to, I'm, I'm probably going to just keep looking up more stuff tonight and continue on and continue on because, you know, as I'm still doing shows, not as many as I used to, but as I'm still doing shows, um, part of what I feel is a responsibility is to try and impart similar knowledge to the current generation moving into the future generation Yeah, where you know, you didn't see like in these matches, you might see the the big punch selling and then they give you the big punch. You wouldn't see like the back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. It just looks so slapstick like the stuff you see today. Yeah. And, you know, when I'm trying to share some knowledge with some of the younger guys, you know, you see a lot of these matches today and a guy gets punched five times just to back him up to the ropes they shoot him off. The guy reverses. It's like, what were those five punches? They didn't yeah. do anything. All I need is one. Yeah. And in both of these matches, nothing is thrown away. No. Nothing thrown away. They get maximum mileage out of everything they do. It's, um, you know, there's an economy to motion and an economy in the movement. Like, they really make the, the most of everything that they do. And that's part of what draws in that atmosphere of believability and legitimacy yeah. you know because if, if you're seeing someone get beat on their leg beat on the leg but now they're doing leapfrogs and moon souls like well i guess his leg doesn't hurt that bad you know but right? uh and that's why i'm such a fan of selling yeah because you're sitting here and you're thinking man i know this is supposed to be predetermined whatever but i think he's hurt i think he's hurt yeah <laughs> and that's when the mark really comes out you know, we're going to so, have, I'm sure we'll have a steamboat match come up because for me, he sold oh, it like yeah. nobody else could. Oh yeah. There's some great steamboat and Terry Funk. It, it was funny because we were talking about Terry just earlier in that you match. That. Yep. Yeah. One of his big insults was you, you egg sucking dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dog okay. <laughs> well you you i mean not okay i'll give you a little teaser for the next episode um funk steamboat could come up it's a tremendous match yeah, that's pretty good yeah um paul this has been amazing uh doing this show with you and and i hope this is the first of many to come uh because it's just been a, a blast um Absolutely. do you where, where can people find you do you have where where do you want people to find you <laughs> on social I media don't. find me in the territories i'll <laughs> be in the cadillac. <laughs> i'll be in my cadillac out in the parking lot find me in the yellow pages under the windows yeah 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 
hanging out with the rats at the bar at the hotel bar. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm just on social media, Instagram and Twitter only, uh, at London Foo, L-O-N-D-O-N-F-U. It's for Kung Fu, not an F-U. Uh, so London Foo. Of course. Um, and that's usually where I post my happenings in terms of travel, wrestling events, uh, anything that I might be doing. Um, it's certainly not where I sit there and compliment someone I just had a blood feud with and say, Hey, where are we going to eat afterwards? Thank you for taking care of me. I love you. Hugs. Yeah. Let's go shopping. No, <laughs> no. because yes, yeah, social media, I blame you. Right. A lot of kayfabe. A lot now, of kayfabe. Guys are more concerned with getting likes and being popular from strangers than maintaining the secrecy of the business. So shame on all of you who do that. Yeah. And mad props to the ones that keep it alive like yourself. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah. you, you can obviously find $2 late fee on all the social medias, uh, Twitter, Instagram, the fun stuff is on Instagram. You guys, yeah. it's a, that's where it's at. And we'll, we'll be putting some fun clips for, uh, you know, uh, territory marks is, is under the $2 late fee banner now. So look for that stuff to pop up on our page, on our YouTube page. Um, we'll, uh, the links to the matches are in the show notes. So go check out those matches. Tell us what you think. Give us your, give us a, give us feedback on it and tell us what some of the stuff you guys like reach out to us on social media, reach out, reach out to us on Patreon. Um, the, the, you know, this, that's the bread and butter of $2 late fee, obviously, but Hit us up. Let us know. We want to know. This is a show for wrestling fans, but it's also a show for nostalgia fans, people who love nostalgia, the 80s, all that good stuff. Because let's be honest, wrestling is one of the few professional sports that's been around from the beginning, and it's going to continue to go on. And hopefully we'll see a nice evolution of more kayfabe and more legit heels and faces and all that good stuff. Oh, so, no, I hope so. If you have a special memory of where you were, in 86 or in 89 around this time feel free to share it yeah because again part of what this is about is sitting there and just you know trying to block out the cte that we were developing and uh That's think CTE. back think back to happier simpler times right. um you know definitely a magical time for not just wrestling but pop culture in general so hell yeah it's been a lot of so much fun, Zach. I'm looking forward to the next one. I'm already going to start compiling a list starting tonight. Me too. I might be busting out my Von Erich's family album. I'm just going to oh, also say that too. So good. So um, good. And, and, and oh, by the way, if you're listening to the show and you were at one of those matches, let us know if, if, if oh. this, like if that comes up, we want to know about that experience because that's a whole other animal. Please, 